Today, Barbados bids farewell to a stoic leader, a champion of education, and the fourth Prime Minister of Barbados, Sir Lloyd Erskine Sandiford. I'm Alison Leacock, and it is my privilege to guide you through a grateful nation's farewell as we honor the memory of a statesman who dedicated his life to the service of this nation. Today, we stand united in gratitude for the indelible mark left by Sir Lloyd on the fabric of Barbadian society. His legacy is one of educational equality, social justice, and unwavering commitment to the well-being of our people and our nation. Today, we find solace in our shared memories, in the stories that will forever be etched in the annals of Barbadian history. We remember Sir Lloyd not only as a leader, but as a quiet, compassionate individual whose influence education will benefit generations to come. As we embark on this solemn journey together, let us remember that today is not only a day of mourning, but a day of reflection, celebration, and profound gratitude for the life and legacy of a humble, dignified Barbadian who represented servant leadership. Stay with us as we bring you live coverage of this state funeral, capturing the emotions, the tributes, and the profound honor by a nation as we stand together shoulder to shoulder, honoring the memory of our fourth Prime Minister, Sir Lloyd Erskine Sandiford. The procession for the funeral of Sir Lloyd leaves the Paramount Funeral Home in just under 45 minutes and will make its way via Highway 1 to St. Peter's Parish Church. At the conclusion of the service, we will follow the procession back down Highway 1 to St. James Cemetery to witness the final chapter of Sir Lloyd's earthly journey. Peter Wickham is one of his former students. Um, we are happy this morning that he could join us. And as we prepare to share all that is going to unfold in this day, we are truly honored to have with us uh, somebody that we consider a renowned political analyst, a prominent figure in Caribbean politics, and one of his students who attributes his passion and interest in this field to the late Sir Lloyd. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Alison. Good to be with you. And uh, I'm happy to share in a reflection on, a positive reflection on Sir Lloyd's life in, in politics. And, and we're glad that you could share that personal experience. Let's begin by you sharing in what ways Sir Lloyd influenced you and to even be interested in, in politics. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a, a, a good place to start. And you know, uh, I went to the Barbados Community College, like many others, and the intention was to study law as an advanced, um, at, at the advanced level. Um, we were told there was, was politics, it was an option, uh, so Lloyd encouraged us to do it. Um, in, in many ways, it was an add-on to, to law because most persons would have had an interest in doing law. Um, when we met Sir Lloyd and he, he made that infamous statement that, you know, this is not a how-to course, it is a what's it, what it is all about course. Um, it it realized, made many of us realize that this was actually, there was a thing called political science that you could study and it could be an enterprise. And his enthusiasm and, and love for it and the knowledge that he imparted was, was so great that it inspired so many of us to say, well, look, maybe this could be our, our life's endeavor, not necessarily to go into political po politics as, as many of his students did, but to, to study it and, and to make it uh, uh, you know, an enterprise. So uh, Professor Marshall, he, he, he's now um, uh, 
heading the South Lewis Institute of, mm -hmm. of Politics at South Lewis Institute That's at UWA. Um, he would be one of his products, as, as am I. Um, but then there were many who got into active politics, you know, the Kerry Simmons, Don Valenis, Chris Sinclair, uh, Chris Sinclair uh, notably. And we were inspired in different ways, but certainly there was a keenness. Uh, and then there were some of his other students who, um, Ivadni Barrow uh, Brewster, would have been one of the earliest uh, female students and one of the most outstanding. And she went on to teach politics and as, is now as well, on the border. At, at the Barbados Community College. She's and is now on the border of yeah. the community college. So, so everything seems to have come full circle. Indeed. But his, his transformational mm. work in education is rooted in that. So again, as a student of his, mm -hmm. what were the triggers that made you want to get into Caribbean politics? Caribbean politics. Well, um, the, the link between history and history had always been interesting, and the link between certainly British political history and ours, it was fascinating, and that was, that was keen. Um, it was also interesting that he was the first person I knew that balanced a political endeavor of his own with a teaching in politics. And sometimes it was difficult to know which he loved most. Mm. Um, we were always struck by the fact that he drew a very clear lane so the, the classroom was not his political platform. Um, and in the classroom, we studied you know, the enterprise of, of politics um, in a very uh, unvarnished and, and very you know, clear, objective way. But then you hear him on a platform, and he's a slightly different person. Uh, and it was fascinating that he was able. So we were inspired by what the possibilities could be. Uh, and then the vast knowledge that he had of the institutions and the way they worked and, you know, the relationship between the two. Um, he, he set us in a research assignment fairly early on the Western helicopter affair uh, in the United Kingdom, which was, was a scandal. Um, but again, you know, having to go and do that kind of original research stimulated my own interest in doing research. And, you know, it's, it's not uh, an accident that I subsequently became a political researcher because it was fascinating that he said, let's go into the history and let's understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, we, we take it from there. So this counterpoint of teacher come politician, mm -hmm. um, of course, leads to the natural question. Mm -hmm. What would you identify as some of his major accomplishments mm. as Prime Minister of Barbados? Well, you, you introduced a, a great word just now, uh, transformational. And I would think that if I were to ask about his transformational work, I would say the, the legacy really is education. Um, Sandiford essentially built out post-secondary education. So the Barbados Community College, the, the Polytechnic, um, were both parts of his understanding that a child leaving school would need some kind of a bridge to take them into university if necessary, or alternatively, a bridge that would take them into life. And I would say that he constructed two major bridges. Um, and the Barbados Community College is a degree-granting institution now, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one hell of a bridge. Uh, so I would say that his enterprise, his educational enterprise as Minister of Education, that would have been it, that we now have post-secondary education. And, you know, we, we were miles ahead of many of the others. I mean, there's South Lewis in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. um, there's the Bastyr College in, in St. Kitts and Nevis and Antigua State. But we were ahead of all of these at the Barbados Community Absolutely. College because of, of his enterprise. I mean, we can talk about the politics as well, if you want. But I, I think that if I were to say legacy and I were to say transformational, I would look to his role as Minister of Education. Mm -hmm. And I think today it is really fortuitous that we are in an era post-COVID where access to education has become even more of a premium. And he had the vision then to recognize that a community college and a Samuel Jackman Prescott, now Institute and um, Polytechnic then, could focus on technical vocational training as well as the access for people who may not have fitted into the traditional collegial approach mm -hmm. that we had in education. Mm -hmm. How did you find he merged his own ability as a teacher mm -hmm. uh, in, in working in the political arena? How did he interact with people like yourself when you became a political scientist and perhaps mm -hmm. critiqued how he was as leading? I mean, that was a, it was, I would say it was an uncomfortable relationship to some extent because you, I, I wrote, uh, I was often critical of him and I knew that he was reading and he knew that he had opinions. 
Um, I was also close to Chris Sinclair, who was his personal assistant. And Chris said, you know, when you dealt with Saloid is as prime minister, he was the same person. So he never missed an opportunity to teach. And, and I think that that is, is reasonable. Um, and as time passed, you know, I became a bit uncomfortable with the fact that you would have to criticize someone that you, you really admired so much. Uh, but, you know, you do what you have to do. And, you know, I think he took it all in stride. I, I was honored when he wrote the first um, book on politics and society um, that he asked if I could review it and review it publicly. Uh, and, and that I did, and I was happy so to do. And it essentially said that he understood, you know, that if there was any criticism or whatnot, I mean, ultimately, this is what you teach your students. Mm -hmm. and, and, and clearly, you know, he felt that as a student, I had done, done reasonably well. So that, that was important. The, the last conversation I had with Soloid um, was essentially about my understanding an important lesson because he was prime minister in a very turbulent time. Um, he brought us to a place in Barbados with, with greater stability, I would say, before he left office. And, you know, I said to him, it's interesting that on reflection, there were a lot of things which I passed judgment on that, you know, you, you, you realize, you look at them differently. And he said, you know, but this is the benefit of hindsight and life. And, and the fact that you can say this means that, you know, you've learned something. Indeed. So even then, you know, the opportunity for him to, to teach was, was, was clearly there. And um, that, that to me is, 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 is significant. The classics, I always remember, uh, he would never miss an opportunity in the course of the classroom to introduce a classical phrase. You know, young Cassius has a lean and hungry look. Indeed. Such men are dangerous. And, and these things stay with you you know, throughout life and the, the importance of them, you will always remember. And he frequently referred to the fact that mm. uh, uneasy lies the head, the head of, of oh yeah. the yes, yes, yes. And this set, uh, congratulations to uh, CBC's mm. Tisha Hines, who is producing our coverage today for having these motifs that represent his love, the roses, mm. uh, he loved to travel the world and his love of music. I uh, understand that his daughter has underscored his, his love of what we would now call vintage reggae, mm -hmm. but it was always uh, reggae as, as, as it was emerging um, throughout his, his life. As you spoke though, Peter, about learning lessons and how we can translate that into the reality of our today, um, the past is prologue as they say. And it is interesting that both Sir Roy Trotman and his successor, General Secretary, the Honorable Tony Moore, have both commented on um, how indeed pivotal what transpired under Sir Lloyd catapulted the labor movement mm -hmm. to, to have a seat at CARICOM's table. Yeah. And similarly, um, really to, to have a voice yeah. that, that remained and the social partnership yeah. which which was uh, his genesis let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about yeah. the role of the social mm -hmm. partnership its evolution and its development mm -hmm. over time yeah and and i would say that again this was one of the sandefordian creations the idea that it was a social partnership um, there was a social partnership before n none in the caribbean and ours was one of the most lasting and it came out of a crisis that was created where it was clear that government was shouting at the trade unions, the trade unions were shouting at government, the private sector was shouting at both government and the trade unions. Um, everybody wants Barbados to succeed, but yet still there was no uh, agreement that we can have certain parameters. Um, he, he said, well, look, let me tackle that head on. And he came up with this idea. Uh, as I understand it, he had seen one operating sometime before. And he put it to the IMF that this was going to be part of his package. It was a novel idea. And it, it was bold because at the time, even though Saroy was a member of the Democratic Labour Party, it was clear that the relations between the, them and, and, and the Democratic Labour Party and certainly him as leader were not the best. Um, there were persons in the private sector that had very little use for, for, for Saroy based on the policies. And it was a tough time, but it was interesting that out of that, he built this institution where the three parties that are pivotal to our development as a country could sit down and come to some agreement. So we had the wages and prices protocol. You know, of course, there, there, there are varying views as to whether or not it has had any success, but one could argue that we don't know what would have happened if it wasn't there. 
And again, it gave labor the opportunity to say, look, we will hold on our demands if you hold on your prices because we understand there's a relationship between the two. And government will also make certain concessions along the way. And, and this is during the 90s when this kind of conversation was not, um, you know, we never had it anywhere else in the Caribbean. And, and frankly, today, there are still very few countries that have a social partnership that's as active as ours. Uh, and it was interesting, one of the first things that Prime Minister Motley did, and, and I think that, again, I see shades of Sandifer's influence in terms of how she has tackled this economic crisis, is that she sat down with the social partners and he said, look, let's come clean and let's understand the state of affairs and let's come to some agreements. Mm -hmm. She shared aspects of the budget which was forthcoming with the social partnership and, you know, they all said it was, was one of the first times it happened. And, you know, it's interesting that many years later she is building her restructuring of our economy on the Sanfordian model and using one of those important institutions. Uh, so that institution called the Social Partnership is, is I would say, again, is part of his legacy as, as leader and one from which we can learn. Um, I also meant to mention earlier that the Barbados Community College, he, he, he said once, was a creation that came out of a need to scrap the 11 plus. And mm -hmm. his idea was that one of the, the problems with post-secondary education is that if you didn't get into one of the colleges, you, you, you had a challenge. So his idea was create a community college, let everyone who wanted to study post-secondary go there, and then automatically you level the playing field of, of, of schools. It didn't work out that way. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, it started a conversation about what needed to be done, and we were able to get this great institution out of it that has done well. But it's important to remember that, yeah, he did, he did say that this was one of his objectives as Minister of Education, to be able to scrap the 11 plus, so it was about leveling the playing field. And I think there are so many opportunities mm -hmm. on reflection and with maturity oh, yeah. that, that we can identify uh, the, the impact of some of his decisions, not just the Barbados Community College where he continued to teach yeah. and <laughs> indeed his now widow, Dr. Angelita Lady Sandiford, was deputy principal. Mm -hmm. So there, there has been a, a serious personal and professional investment mm -hmm. in education. We just saw shots of mm -hmm. the center that was mm -hmm. considered at the time a white elephant, mm -hmm. now named after him and busy. Mm -hmm. I think if you, if you can get a booking, uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're lucky. Yeah. So again, it is very often being ahead of your time. And many of us, as we get older, see the <laughs> wisdom of certain decisions. And my, my other question to you, uh, Peter, is really within the pantheon of Caribbean leaders, mm -hmm. where would you place Sir, Sir Lloyd's contribution within mm -hmm. the CARICOM movement? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's always a difficult question to ask because there's a presumption that you are the leaders. Um, Sandiford was not of the Barrow and, and Burnham and Bird era. Uh, so he was not part of the creation of either CARIFTA or CARICOM. And I would say that that era with Manly and so on was, mm. was, was a, they, they had a particular, um, you know, objective. I would say that Sandifer's era in the 90s was about leaders who had to manage a struggle, economic struggle, and had to manage change from these legacy leaders to persons who had to work a little harder to become who they were. Um, he also had another problem in that he took over from someone who died. And of course, there, there are varying views as to whether or not he was the right person to have taken over, but that's not for today. Uh, but the reality is that he was one of those leaders who had to struggle with that. So um, George Chambers, he came mm -hmm. after um, Eric Williams and faced the same challenge that Erskine Sanford would have faced. And before him, we had Brie St. John, who came after Tom Adams, and he didn't fare well politically. So I would say that the fact that Erskine Sandiford won an election is significant because it automatically places him at least equal to, to George Chambers. Um, I would say Chambers had a lot less success in terms of managing the economy of Trinidad and Tobago before things went, went sour. Um, I would say Sir Lloyd essentially introduced a program of management. A number of countries in the 90s were going through these same economic challenges and successfully piloted us through without the deleterious effects of devaluation and things of that nature. So to me, that helps to, to, to create a space for him. Um, he didn't have the, the charisma of an Alvaro 
or, or a, a, certainly a Bird or Burnham or any of those. But nonetheless, his, I would say, technocratic work as a leader created the opportunity for us to understand how leadership varies and, and, and the kind of different perspective you can have on leadership. And I would say that that, that definitely places him up there. Later, he introduced something called the Assembly of Caribbean Community Parliamentarians, which never saw the light of day. Um, in my humble opinion, had that been taken on, it would have introduced a parliamentary component to CARICOM that would have been revolutionary. The, the challenge is that at the time that he was uh, proposing it, it was not a transformational moment in terms of CARICOM politics, largely because you know, all the islands were struggling with getting themselves economically sorted out. Uh, and you know there wasn't really time for that, but um, certainly had they had we moved in terms of this assembly of Caribbean community parliamentarians, we would have a parliamentary institution now, which is similar to the to the European Parliament, that gives life and, and conversation and you know a parliamentary boost to what was 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 being done at those levels. So I would say that that would be how I would characterize his contribution. Um, I, I'm not really about comparing, but I think it gave us the opportunity to see a model that was not the Burnham Barrow model, but a model that had equal relevance, uh, equal contribution, and a model that, frankly, um, more of us were likely to become like, because um, you know, a lot of those leaders, you, you're not going to have their opportunities again. But I think that the ability to manage change and so on was, was what Sir Lloyd would have been able to present as his, his, his alternative model of, of management. And he did this while remaining very committed to his constituents. Yeah. Uh, I think we, we haven't spent a lot of time on how he was received and still is mm -hmm. received and respected mm -hmm. by the constituents of mm -hmm. St. Michael's South. What were your observations during his period of time uh, as, a, as mm -hmm. an MP? Yeah, well, he was, a, he was an interesting campaigner. Um, it, it was interesting when so Lloyd was on the platform. He was not someone that was inclined towards, uh, you know, abusive language and cussing people, and that that was not his style. Um, it was always a more one could say a more technocratic delivery, but it was a delivery that was certainly very different. The constituents loved him. You know, he he did quite a bit of house to house campaigning, and he pressed the flesh, and you know, he would not be known as one of those that would spend a lot of money. But he, he is a person who would bring, you know, produce to a constituent, and then some of them would bring produce to him. That was the kind of a person that, that he was. People would always be able to find him, you know, as, as needed, and he was, he was close to constituents in that way. Um, but as I said, the significant thing for me was that he was not a, a, a person who would, you know, hurrah on the platform. You know, he was a, a, a person that would work hard in the Huskins and he would press the flesh and he would do his door to door campaigning, the host to host campaigning. Um, it, and in all of this, every Sunday he would sing in the choir at St. Paul's. And, you know, it fascinated me that he had time for all of this stuff. You know, he was still, still um, he would have his constituency clinics. And, and then, uh, you know, he was very, very committed to St. Paul's. Um, I was surprised that St. Paul's was not the venue for his funeral, but I understand that his childhood association was, mm -hmm. was with the other church. But, um, you know, he was a, a strong supporter. If he was not in the choir, he was in the, in the, um, in the congregation. Uh, and he was very, very committed to that journey as well, a devout Christian and, and someone who, um, not only in terms of his, his, his words, but his deeds, you know, sought to, to emulate um, the, the work that Jesus did, uh, and I'm sure Canon will tell us a bit more about that later. Indeed. Yeah. I think um, in many ways he embodies a, a, an authentic Barbadianness mm -hmm. that has emerged quite differently today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Barbadians have a, a tradition of wanting to read the fine print, yeah. uh, being unassuming, but being enduring, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of what he has done. I think can fall into all of those categories. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it brings me then to, to the point of how his work-life balance and his ability to continue to remain connected, but always think about the average Barbadian. Mm -hmm. And even in the details of mm -hmm. planning his funeral and, and being quite precise mm -hmm. about what he wanted um, in today's mm -hmm. execution of our tributes to him. I think those are all 
really very eloquent statements mm -hmm. about the man, but also about what we as Barbadians could do to honor his memory by mm -hmm. continuing along those lines in terms of what we do as Barbadians and how we celebrate who we are without apology. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do think that that's one of the things about him that stood out. He was very comfortable in his skin mm -hmm. and really and truly um, sort of weathered every storm, mm -hmm. but never held any malice. So that brings me to the, the, yeah. the point <laughs> of how he reacted mm -hmm. to those who others may have pilloried mm -hmm. after the fact because of the decisions that they took mm -hmm. disagreeing with some policies that he was making mm -hmm. and and what it says about his personality mm -hmm. in his ability to let bygones be bygones and, and respond to people what well, what are your experiences yeah. with that yeah the i think that the initial assumption that many people had was that Sir Lloyd was thin-skinned the reality is that he was anything but thin-skinned um, I was critical of him, um, and he he was never um, prone towards you know a, a reaction. Certainly within the Young Democrats at the time, you know there was a high level of criticism. Sanford took it in stride. You know, you know, young people have to have the opportunity to express themselves, and one has to respect that. Um, Calypsonians, I think that there is, it's difficult to find a prime minister who was more derided in, in Calypso tents and in Calypso as the nurse in Sandiford. Because we had a, a period after the government collapsed where we had, what, three months and a Calypso season before we had an election. And, um, you know, all of the leaders, all of the Calypsonians took a turn in Saloid and he would go to Calypso tents in full knowledge that he was being mocked in the Calypso tents and he would do that. As he said, that's a, that's a Barbadian uh, it's a special type of Barbadian that it will take to handle that level of criticism. But even on a, on a more personal level with the, the, the three, um, you know, they, they sat at the DLP headquarters subsequent to the, the incident and, and broke bread together. Um, you know, there were no hard feelings. And it's difficult after you see people who are responsible for your political demise. And, you know, he, he said publicly, you know, I forgive them all. Um, Sandifer's main concern after that was how do you address my own personal legacy and how do I fix the perception of me as a leader? Mm. I, have a, I don't have a score to settle with them. And I thought that that was important when he first addressed it in, in a conversation and he said, you know, I have no score to settle with them. I do feel, however, I need to address the, the rightfulness of what I did as a person. Uh, and I would say that history has judged him kindly on that. And that was fascinating because it, it's difficult to lead a country and he proved that without being criticized. And there will be people who will, will oppose you, um, you know, and you have to understand that you, you, can, you can do that and go away. Uh, I saw a picture recently which um, from Wickham Jacobs sent to me of Sir Lloyd um, and along with uh, John Wickham and uh, Lammy Craig on, on the Great Wall of China. And I thought it was interesting because Sir Lloyd is hugging Lamy Craig, who uh, subsequently became, of course, this was before, subsequently came out of his political adversaries, uh, and, and that was interesting. But I'm sure that he would have hugged him after as well, you know, because Indeed. that was the, the way that he operated. One of the early uh, things he did at community college, because, of course, he had a class of people who were interested in politics in a real way, um, he brought uh, Owen Arthur mm -hmm. to do a lecture on economics. Um, a guest lecture on economics at the Barbados Community College. Chris Sinclair reminded me of that recently. Uh, again, not someone who was a political adversary, you know, but at that time he was a rising star in the Ministry of, of Finance and Sandiford, even though he was in opposition, thought it was useful to give us the opportunity to interact, you know, with, with him on that level. Uh, so yeah, the, the ability to be able to, to let things pass and is is an important part of being leader and I think that that's another lesson that he taught that in order to be a leader you have to have a broad back yes, and you have to do. take a punch and roll with them. If you're just joining us we are awaiting the move off from the funeral home that is scheduled for 11:15. you're not missing anything we are reminiscing on the life and times of Sir Lloyd and we will be joining Cassandra Crawford when she is at the 
Paramount Funeral Home around 11.15. So we're reminiscing with Peter Wickham, a former student of Soloids, and of course, a political scientist. And one of the things that I think we can continue our conversation about is this ability to reach across the aisle as we say today, because the legacy of Barbados's political history is that you have had many people uh, who are very capable of combining mm. political mm. votes and being friends yeah. um, outside of Parliament. On our screen, we see members of the Barbados Defence Force and the Royal Barbados Police Force uh, getting ready for the official move off, uh, the, the departure from the Paramount Funeral Home uh, for Sir Lloyd to begin his journey. Uh, and we will, of course, keep you posted at every step of the way in that journey to ensure that you do not miss anything. And indeed, one of the details that we will be discussing, we have uh, the benefit of Major Alfred Taylor joining us uh, on set today. And I always marvel, Peter, at the precision and the detail that is involved in events such as this and ceremonies that require the level of planning and detailed precision that's choreographing the entire process today. So uh, Major Taylor will be on set with me to provide some important insights about this process and what it all means for us as a nation today. And the, the issue of mm -hmm. uh, political mm -hmm. camaraderie mm -hmm. um, from people of, of uh, different political sides is something that I think um, we've lost a little bit of it, and I hope it, it comes back mm -hmm. to, to, again, honor Sir Lloyd's legacy mm -hmm. in, in that way, because he certainly has demonstrated the ability to mm. connect. Yeah, I think I think in many ways the the environment has changed and the, 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 the races and the political battles now are a lot more the stakes are higher. Uh, and as a result I think that there's a more a higher level of determination and, and grit. Um, I think in his time they understood politics very differently and um, one could argue that the stakes were lower but certainly they, they had a different understanding. And yeah, there was this, this friendship across the aisle, which was certainly always a, a fascinating point. Um, one of the things I thought we should also mention is what Sir Lloyd did after. I mean, he was unusual in that he was not a, a, a lawyer. And we had, we had a slew of leaders, not only regionally, but in Barbados that were lawyers and could return to their uh, law post. Um, he returned to the classroom, and he returned to the classroom in an environment that he himself helped to create as minister. And I thought that that was also an important lesson to, to learn. Paramount Funeral Home, as Sir Lloyd begins his journey. Members of the Barbados Police Force, no. The, the Barbados Defense Force. As members of the media, try to capture every moment for history. The procession will move off at 11.15 from the Paramount Funeral Home. And along the journey, we will have uh, many of the school children who will carry on his legacy from the schools in his constituency, as well as students from the Barbados Community College. And Barbadians from all walks of life have the opportunity to also follow this funeral uh, as he would have wanted for the people of Barbados. There are remote sites uh, set up 
at Hero Square as well as uh, the Barbados Community College and indeed the, uh, they are also in the gazebo, I believe. Uh, there are a number of locations set up for Barbadians to witness the funeral. Of course, the church has limited seating. They expect their 1,700 people to be uh, in attendance. And we want to make sure, and they wanted to make sure, that the, everyone could be a part of it. So we have a number of areas where they can indeed. The Graydon Seeley Secondary School is one. Uh, National Hero Square, as I mentioned, the, the Spitestown Esplanade, and of course the Barbados Community College in their Liberal Arts Auditorium, and the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center. So if you are interested and want to make sure you don't miss anything and have to be on the road, those are some locations you can join. Uh, we know that there's limited space at the church. And just to remind everyone that uh, the Barbados Public Service will close at 12.30 today to allow officers to pay their final respects uh, to Sir Lloyd. So his alma mater, uh, as a symbolic gesture, there will be five students from St. Albans Primary, uh, Coleridge and Parry, and Harrison College. They will actually attend the church service and there will be five students each from the Bay Primary School, St. Paul's Primary, and Graydon Seeley Secondary School, all located in St. Michael's South constituency, which Sir Lloyd represented for over 30 years. And they will also attend the church service. They will line the route at specific points along the way uh, in Spitestown and in Holtown. And so we, we look forward to more memories and more recollections of the life and work of Sir Lloyd. We are expecting to hear from the president of the Democratic Labour Party, who is overseas on assignment in China. And of course, they are 12 hours difference. So uh, we are hoping that we can connect with him for, to give his personal tribute at this time. Yeah, Alison, you, you, you mentioned um, schools, and it's important to, to note that Sir Lloyd was the first non-Harrison College Prime Minister that Barbados had. Uh, he did attend Harrison College, but initially he would have attended Corrigan Parry, uh, and I think it's also important to, to pay tribute. He was the first, and then ironically, um, he gave way to another Corrigan Parry Prime Minister, uh, and that was, in a sense, a difference, because it there was a mystique about the type of person who could lead Barbados and the type of school that person would have attended. And I think that in many ways he also shattered that perception by becoming our first non harrison College Prime Minister. Uh, and, and that was, was also a significant achievement. He's also the oldest, he is the Prime Minister who has lived longest. And at his passing now, um, he has presented us with a model Prime Minister who uh, would have been able to retire from office and live for a considerable period of time. Because one of the, the concerns that we have is that our prime ministers in Barbados, the, the mortality often is threatened by the nature of the job. Mm -hmm. um, it, he, he also dealt with that, I would say, and you know, has demonstrated a, a relatively long and complete life, which makes it easier for, to, for us to handle today's events because we're not looking on at a life that was cut short. We're looking on at a life which appeared to have been complete and also, you know, would have, uh, he would have seen certain accomplishments in retirement, and retirement, a considerable time in retirement before himself becoming the first resident ambassador to China, uh, which, which was another singular achievement on, on his part in having done so. Indeed. And uh, as, as we were talking, we could see that the procession uh, is getting ready to move off from the Paramount Funeral Home where Cassandra Crawford is and the official procession will begin in three minutes according to my 
timing and they are getting ready uh, to move off. Always a moment for us to celebrate the contributions of, of many of the this nation builders of Barbados. But equally, I think for the next generation to begin to see the connection between what has gone before and some of the things that they benefit from. Uh, and therefore, the students of those schools and definitely the students of Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute and the Barbados Community College, uh, that, that will live on for some time to come. And I think um, from, from your perspective, as uh, one of the major parties in this country, I think um, you must have some unique perspectives on Sir Lloyd's role in the development of the Democratic Labour Party. Yeah, because certainly as the DLP, and I think even now, is, is struggling to identify that which it did that was great. The work in education stands out easily as the Democratic Labour Party's uh, most important contribution to the development of this country because we appreciate that both parties would have benefited. But when we think of education, we think of, of, of a, a situation in which uh, Kami Trudeau before, and certainly Sir Lloyd would have been the architects of our educational system as it currently stands, you know. Um, you know, even up to and including the University of the West Indies, but beyond that, it, it would, would have been important. I mentioned schools earlier, and I also forgot to mention that he was also our first UWA Prime Minister uh, because uh, he would have, um, all of the others would have studied in England and so on. So in a sense, he, he localized or regionalized the leadership. So that's also something that we need to remember. But yeah, but as far as the Democratic Labour Party is concerned, I think that his legacy in education is an important part of the DLP. It's essentially a cornerstone of the Democratic Labour Party's legacy. And I think that that party will reflect fondly on the contributions that he would have made to the educational component in Barbados, which they can also claim, claim as their own. I mean, there are other things, but, but that is, is something that we definitely would say is significant. Indeed. I think we want to definitely go to the Paramount Funeral Home. So we are in step with the procession as it moves off um, from that location. And I would also like to invite um, Major Alfred Taylor from the Barbados Defense Force uh, to join me uh, so that he can also... Okay. But of course, the cortege is about to move off, so we will continue to share with you today. So we've lost a little bit of sound from Cassandra there, but we can see that they are ready to begin. And we certainly want to uh, make sure that Major Taylor can join me so that he can walk us through the choreography and the anticipation of what we expect to see. We are now at the bottom of Station Hill or at the top of Bridge Road, however you want to look at it. And we can take the procession in. Uh, Major Taylor, you are resplendent in your official uniform today for a really special occasion. We welcome you and uh, we are, we are delighted that you could be a part of this process to unpack for us a lot of what is involved um, from the point of view of the Barbados Defense Force. We know that at this point, everybody's in place and your security details um, throughout the route are in place. But perhaps you can walk us through what we can expect from this procession at this stage. Uh, we are now uh, coming on along Bank Hall. To the start point for the ceremonial procession, uh, which is already formed up, likely, and awaiting the arrival of the 
this party, the casket will be transferred to the gun carriage and the formal procession will commence. And there is a story about uh, the, the introduction of gun carriages for state funerals. I, I believe that initially uh, the, the, the carriage was led by horses, uh, but in 1901 it was, I think they introduced the, the gun carriage because of uh, uh, the, the horses being spooked. Well, the, the idea of the gun carriage is pretty ancient. Um, this is where the artillery, uh, this is how they transported their heavy guns. Um, and it was used in funeral processions to carry naturally the coffins of their fallen comrades. Came into use in formal processions as well. And the story goes that when Queen Victoria was being uh, drawn by horses, mm -hmm. that did not work out quite so well. And from then, it was drawn by contingent of the Royal Navy. Oh, we don't have a Royal Navy of that mm -hmm. magnitude in Barbados. Um, so we use the ceremonial Land Rover yes. to draw the casket on the gun carriage. And how many, how many days and hours of rehearsal have you had to go through to ensure that nothing goes wrong today? Well, as you will expect from the military, these things are planned in very careful detail, rehearsed in very careful detail. The force sergeant major, Master Chief Petty Officer Austin Howell, would have been the chief architect of the parade. He and his team would have paced the route, checked everything out, timed everything to precision, constructed the what we call the administrative instructions for the parade, the parade appointments would have been made and the entire thing rehearsed on a number of occasions just to make sure we have everything absolutely perfect. And along with your own rehearsals for that level of detail, uh, there, there are the logistical details for members of the public to appreciate where they can go, where they can't go, and what are some of the things that we can look out for. What, perhaps you could walk us through where we expect to see major activity on the route. Sure, there are two processions that you will look out for. The first is going to be from the area of Batali's, just at the start of Spikestown, and the procession will go all the way to the St. Peter Parish Church, where they will have the formal service. At the end of that service, the, pr the procession of cars, vehicles, will move down to the area of Trent in St. James, and another procession to the grave site will commence from there. And have you also had to include uh, many of the players in that procession uh, in your rehearsals, or have you had to, to use your uh, well, substitutes? I assure you that every single thing was rehearsed. All the things that we see today happening will have had um, their fair share of rehearsal to make sure everything goes exactly according to plan. Wonderful. And there are Barbadians all across the island today trying to take it in. Of course, the place that feels as if it is Sir Lloyd's own, the Barbados Community College, is also one of those locations. And I believe that there are some students and members of the faculty, who, as well as members of the public from the community surrounding uh, Barbados Community College, who are uh, observing all that is happening uh, at this point at the, the Community College Auditorium. There they are. and. Uh, I know that the college is in mourning on many levels and will have its own tribute with the family uh, this Friday. There is a book of condolence set up at the Barbados Community College as well. And these are some of the students who will be participating in this ceremony. And they are now um, making their way on the bus to ensure that they are part of this process. The, the college has uh, 
two funerals today, uh, as it were, because one of, of the staff members' sons was a recent road fatality, and that funeral is also today. So the college is in mourning, but the college is also uh, saluting the contribution of Sir Lloyd to its existence and the future of these young minds who have taken advantage of these opportunities uh, to pursue where they will go in the future. So Major Taylor, as we continue on the procession, um, what are some of the areas that the, the, the Barbados Defense Force has to ensure uh, will not be interrupted, that there will be no um, interventions from Murphy? As we know, Murphy's law, uh, Murphy is, is a very busy man. Well, as I said, everything very carefully rehearsed, very carefully timed. The Barbados Defense Force, along with the Barbados Police Service, will also be responsible for elements of security along the route. The route um, for the procession will also be lined by members of the Barbados Cadet Corps and some of our school children. Um, and that forms a sort of solid line which uh, will not be breached. Um, but the security forces, visible and invisible, will be very much present to ensure that all goes well. Would you be able to hazard a guess at the numbers of the, the, both the Defence Force and the, the police service, Barbados Police Service, and others who are involved in, in today's state funeral? Well, on parade itself, we will have a full guard of honour leading the procession. We'll also have a detachment of officers of the Barbados Police Service bringing up the rear of the detachment. And we'll also have the massed band of the Barbados Defence Force and Barbados Police Service, in addition to the bureau party, etc. So there is a pretty heavy commitment. The Guard of Honour alone is going to be about 100 soldiers. Um, the principle is that the level of salute you were accorded in life, you are accorded in death. And as Prime Minister, he would have been entitled to a full guard of honour um, on arrival, etc. So he will get that. And um, he would have had the band on parade, etc., a detachment of the police service on parade. All of that is in place for his funeral procession. The, of course, the focus of the parade will naturally be the gun carriage driven by the ceremonial Land Rover, the very same Land Rover that would have been on independence parades or whatever during his uh, service. So full spread, full works from the military with um, full support from the Barbados Police Service. And we see the finished product, but you've talked about the heads that, and the hands and the hearts that have gone into the preparation for this. Uh, what, what time did your day begin today? <laughs> well, mine didn't begin quite as early as the others, um, but the, the troops would have been um, preparing for this departure from the base from around uh, 9.30 hours this morning. And of course, that's the time that they're meant to be ready to move and you can easily work backward an hour or two for them to prepare their full ceremonial uniforms. Um, so you're talking of pressing uniforms, getting the cravats right, shining the boots, polishing your medals. Um, so it takes a fair bit of preparation. Um, the band will be preparing their instruments, checking their music. The gun carriage will be inspected. The ceremonial Land Rover and backup Land Rover will all be readied and everything just be, must be absolutely pristine, as you would expect from the military. Well, we noticed as you walked into the studio the impeccable deportment of your uniform. How, how are these uniforms uh, made, maintained, preserved, and, and the, the, the glistening uh, medals? Well, that's, that's an interesting one. In the earlier days of the Barbados Defense Force, the uniforms were made in the United Kingdom. These days, um, uniforms such as mine are made locally in Barbados Excellent. by an expert team. 
um, and I must say they fit very comfortably. Um, perhaps even more so than the UK manufactured um, uniforms for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons. They're, they're custom made <laughs> and uh, I think that again this is our maturity and our evolution Indeed. and our true independence. Indeed and this reminds me of the story of the gun carriage because, you know, being a former colony, a, a lot of our military pr um, protocols and practices are inherited from the United Kingdom. Back in the early 80s, um, when there was a need to have a gun carriage for a state funeral, um, it was noted that we didn't have one. And the option at the time was to perhaps fly one in from Jamaica. Uh, Brigadier Lewis, then Chief of Staff, Brigadier Lewis, yes. typical of his style, told one of his officers, I think it was Captain Vernon Collin at the time, make one. In, in 96 hours? <laughs> in 96 hours. Yes. Uh, Captain Connell, um, typical officer form, went to the officer's mess and poured a stiff drink to steady his nerves, <laughs> gather his thoughts. And while there, glancing around at some of the furniture and fixtures of the mess, noted that there was a model of a gun carriage. And he and his team, Warrant Officer Goldburn Johnson, I think it was at the time, were able to construct a gun carriage um, of sufficient quality that it is still in use today. Wow. So again, uh, there are a number of, of demonstrations of, of things bleeding that we we really can celebrate our workmanship, our craftsmanship. And I think Sir Lloyd being the quintessential Bajan, it is wonderful that we can indeed talk about the fact that you now have custom made uniforms made right here in Barbados. And the fact that the inclusiveness of Barbadians in this state funeral is also a testimony to uh, the, the best tribute that we could pay to, to someone who was a very proud Barbadian, a quiet, dignified Barbadian, but a very proud one um, in, in his life and legacy at the same time. I think from the perspective of Defence Force, the fact that we now have so many skilled persons as members of the Defence Force acquiring their skills from the Barbados Community College and the Sam Jackman Prescott um, Institute of Technology um, gives us a real sense of coming of age, of our homegrown skills. And I think it's quite reasonable to, to thank Sir Lloyd um, for making those things possible, for making us Indeed. able to be independent in that regard. And as we watch this procession, it is really uh, an appropriate nexus, Peter, between what we are seeing and we are able to celebrate now and some of the outputs and outcomes in mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. as a student, uh, a former student uh, of uh, Sir Lloyd's. What, what do you think would be his most fervent wish for today? Having gone through the planning and ensured that he indicated what he wanted um, for this day. What are some of the things that you think he would treasure about today? Yeah, and then as, as Major was saying, I think that he would be happy to know that the soldiers in his honor guard would have been wearing locally made uniforms. Um, and I think, you know, and it, it just struck me that the Barbados Defense Force itself would have been built out. And I, I'm watching as we are probably approaching the spot where he originally lived in St. James, so we have to keep an eye on that. Yes, I'm looking for But um, yeah, the Barbados Defense Force uh, would have been built out professionally by a cadre of people who would have become engineers and managers because the, the officers of the Barbados Defense Force carry a number of, of capacities and skills. And many of them would have benefited from post-secondary education at institutions that he would have created. And I think that the fact that you have persons who are involved not only in planning and execution uh, and also the commentary that would have been part of his uh, student body or alternatively coming out of a student um, movement that he would have started is, is something that he would be very happy to know. Um, 
the, the local component, you know, is, is, is absolutely important in that. And I think that that's one of the things that he would be celebrating today, that we do have somewhat of a local component. The Sandy First Center, so Lloyd, um, his, his center, the fact that that will be also uh, a focus of this is important. The fact that he was lying in state at the Democratic Labour Party, which would have been the political party that gave him the opportunity mm -hmm. to become Prime Minister of Barbados, and he's always grateful to that. Uh, those are some of the things I think that he would, would reflect fondly on, and the fact that that can be you know, remembered today as part of that conversation. And as I watch here, I see hotel workers mm -hmm. and others coming out to pay their respects en route. As you say, we are approaching Hill Vista, which is his home just opposite uh, Glitter Bay. And I think for him, you mentioned his ability to be in the choir and remain mm -hmm. connected. He was clearly a family man. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that we are happy that we could indeed do is capture some of the recollections of his own children and uh, I, I, I believe that we are able to share some of that uh, very shortly, where we get a glimpse of the private man, uh, not only the lecturer, not only the, the prime minister, not only the member of parliament, but the father and the husband and the grandfather and on all that he brought to, to his home life, which you can still see. I wanted to also uh, make a point that the hospitality sector, and we are passing many of the hospitality uh, sector institutions on the West Coast now, um, many of them would also owe a debt of gratitude to Sir Lloyd because the Barbados Community College has a hospitality institute, which is essentially one of the premier hospitality institutes in the region. It is. And it has been responsible for professionalizing the um, culinary arts, bartending, um, even housekeeping in, in many of the hotels and pr producing a professional cadre of persons who can offer services to that industry. So I think it is appropriate that members of that industry would, would want to stand and pay um, homage to him as he passes, you know, essentially seeing what he would have created. It is the only uh, experiential learning mm -hmm. hotel institute, but I do think um, as we celebrate all of this, let us hear from his family yeah. what it has been like sharing him mm -hmm. with Barbados and the world. Today we pay tribute to a remarkable man whose legacy extends far beyond the realm of politics. As we bid farewell to the late Sir Lloyd Erskine Sandiford, Barbados mourns the loss of a visionary leader, an esteemed educator, and a loving family man. His contributions to the nation and his unwavering commitment to his principles have left an indelible mark on the hearts and minds of all who knew him. This was in 2013, uh, uh, so my, yes. my middle sister, Sherry Ann, she had passed away, and we went to St. Paul's Church, and I, there was this moment, and every time I come across, I always stop and think, because I got to see a sight of him that I, myself, personally hadn't seen, and there's this one particular photograph where he, uh, Anna, uh, my youngest niece, he's holding her hand, he has on his dress pants and a, and a vest, and a tie, and he's just walking down the street holding her hand. I, and I, I, every time I look at it, I always think like, wow, you know, this was, there was this tender sight to him. Yeah. Um, and they would just walk in and, and she, you could probably say she was his favorite granddaughter. <laughs> and I always remember that. And every time I come across it, I, I, I look at it and I stop and I think about it. Because uh, um, that was, that was, I think how he was with, 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 with his family. Do you remember the time when we went to Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center mm -hmm. with your son, mm -hmm, Michael, and my daughter? And um, Kira was wasn't here; she had gone on a school trip. But yes, we all went as a family to show he wanted to show his grandchildren the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center, and 
what it meant to him to to, mm -hmm. to be a part of its founding and building and everything. And we, we did a, a we walked through the building and we have photos with with the children in it. Yeah, yeah that was also a and we took a picture by the sign with all of us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, I remember yeah. I remember when I was a a young young and he was talking about how Barbados needed a state of the art convention center that they could host conferences, yes. first class conferences. And yeah. I remember him talking about it um, uh, almost like it was an obsession of his. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it did come true. It did when, come the, true. when the SIDS, SIDS conference came, he was, he was excited, he was exhilarated, he was tired, but it all came to fruition then. And he was so inspired, he wrote the poem. Um, oh, to the environment. Oh, to the environment. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah he I gave remember. me a copy of that. Um, I'm happy to share it with you. Yeah, yeah. oh, to the environment. It is yeah. uh, as as uh, Minister uh, Jordan was saying yesterday. He was talking about the environment before it became a thing. Yes, <laughs> yes. Before it became a thing, I, yeah. I I think, you know, Barbados is 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 something that was my father was extremely proud of. He was proud to represent Barbados and. And he met a lot of world leaders. I remember actually the, the one time he went to South Africa to, to meet with President de Klerk before Nelson Mandela uh, took over. And he talked about that trip and, and uh, all these like interesting people that he met. I remember uh, um, Uncle Branford's daughter sent me a photograph of him and Fidel Castro yeah, yeah. in Cuba. Um, uh, there, there is a photograph in sight that we have of, of him and uh, Errol Barrow and Philip Graves um, that uh, I shared with his daughter uh, recently. You know, these, these, these like iconic, nostalgic uh, things that, 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 that he um, has done. And, and you know, I, I see my father as a, as a larger than life individual. When I, when I look back and reflect, he, he definitely was an icon of the Caribbean. Yes. Um, um, I, I believe our, our Prime Minister, um, um, Motley, referred to him as a nation builder. Um, he was part of that founding father with Arrow Barrow and all those uh, great individuals to help to, to establish this country. I think for him, he wanted to see Barbados be on par with everyone else. And I think uh, as, as Barbadians, we all should be proud um, uh, for his leadership and the leadership of those that came before him to make this nation a great nation. Uh, and Barbados is a beautiful place, some place that, that many people are coming to now. Uh, and we might be a small island, but we are known throughout the world. Poignant recollections there from the daughter and son of Sir Lloyd. And uh, Peter had to leave us because he is actually attending the funeral. So we want to thank him for sharing his recollections. But joining us on set is former Senator Reggie Hunt. And he has the distinction of being called the historian of the Democratic Labour Party. So it is my pleasure to welcome him to share his recollections of Sir much. Lloyd. And it, it's good to have you join us, sir. And I very much would like to know from your perspective what today means to you and, of course, the Democratic Labour Party, where uh, we know that there, there are remote sites set up there for other Barbadians to, to join in paying our respects to our fourth prime minister. Well, uh, thank you very much. I, I've heard so much from Peter. I wonder if he left anything for me to say. Well, you're the historian, <laughs> so I'm sure that you have uh, recollections that are unique to you and to the party. Very much so. Um, Mr. Sandy Ferdas is really known. He had joined the party uh, in 1964. I, myself, I joined in 1967. And... Um, I must say he, was, he always struck that note as a person, have to be repeated, that was interested 
in education. I cannot speak about any of the institutions that he attended, um, but I can speak of the institution in which he belonged, and the which I was, the Democratic mm -hmm. Labour Party. And uh, he, very clear, always very clear, I mean, graduating in English with it, he, he seemed to have mastered that, and therefore he always spoke in those terms. And he was greatly admired in the Democratic Labour Party. I must say, a lot of people may not like to hear it, but he really was a favorite of Errol Walton Barrow. Mm -hmm. And um, that is clear because when any leader appoint, um, appoint anybody as a personal aide, that means a lot. And I mean any leader. Personal is just what it is. Trustworthy, could be a good advisor. All of those things uh, obviously go into a personal aid as chosen by a leader. Mm -hmm. And in Mr. Barrow's case, of course, that was no, you know, that was what part of, what part of it was. And look how he, he, ris he had risen. He moved from being a personal aid. You know, in the 1966 uh, election, although he joined the party in 64, 64, I never remember him featuring on the platform in that election. Mm -hmm. And I have seen a lot of them as a 17 year old, I must remind you at that time. Um, but after he be, was appointed to the personal aide, he then became the, the um, in the Senate, appointed to the Senate, or recommended to the Senate uh, by Mr. Barrow. And from there he was able to master this area of education. Um, became a minister in 1968. Um, in 67, he joined the Senate, 1968, when he started to really put, transform the education system in Barbados, and hence the, the community college came about. Um, you know, I always remember him saying this, that any man who have not made a mistake has made nothing. And that is not to say that he didn't make or he did make one when the, the uh, community college came, came into being. Mm -hmm. But the point is um, that didn't go down very well with some of the persons who were, who were already in the teaching system <laughs> because the reaction was about the salaries. Mm -hmm. And I think that the salaries were hardly anything, if I can remember, for teachers because they were graded yes. at that time. And uh, my aunt was a teacher. And um, female teachers were getting less than a male teacher. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Sandiford, obviously being a teacher himself, would have seen to that, that those salaries were increased. And they were. Mm -hmm. And a male teacher, a female teacher, yes, was getting less, because my dad was a teacher, was getting less than a male. a male teacher. And that was moved almost immediately to equalize with first grade and second grade and all that. That went through the window, and females and male teachers were getting the same salary. And the, the, the increase was tremendous, I, I remember, very much so. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting that you raise that because yeah. I mentioned earlier with Peter that the Sandiford family embraced the college because uh, Angelita Lady Sandiford yes. was a deputy principal yes, there as well was. and yeah. he was himself That's right. a tutor. It is my understanding we are watching the procession so we're not missing anything mm -hmm. while we hear your rich kernels of knowledge mm -hmm. but I understand that the community college students also did a tribute uh, to uh, Sir Lloyd. I believe this is a drone view mm -hmm. of some of the preparations at Batali's. And uh, I think this is, is just to alert, alert us and to let our viewers know and our listeners, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as the case may be, yeah. that we are missing nothing. We are staying uh, on on track with the procession and we will continue to share all that is happening. Right. So 
this is the preparation at Batali's and uh, former Senator Reggie Hunt, the historian of the Democratic Labour Party, has joined us to share his recollections. We ended at the point of Sir Lloyd ensuring that there was parity of treatment between female and male teachers. teachers yes. And I think it's a good point for us to show what the tribute from the community college looked like mm -hmm. um, while we await uh, the advance of the procession. This is the tribute, this is the, the book of condolence that has been set up at the college. And I'm aware that the college will itself be doing a tribute to Sir Lloyd next Friday, as I believe the Democratic Labour Party will be doing on Wednesday. Wednesday next week, that's right. On Wednesday next that's week. That's right. Uh, so, I have a lot to say there. Yes, I am sure that you will have a lot to say there. <laughs> And, and we, we look at the celebration and distinction of uh, Sir Lloyd in what really was his brainchild at a time that the Caribbean did not have any other Institutions of that nature. Nothing of That's that right. nature. Yeah. And it really is a demonstration of the power and the value of access to education for people who may have not fitted into the traditional collegial approach That's quite right. to education, That's to quite this right. developmental approach. So a wonderful tribute by the college to him to show their gratitude for the architect of their existence and the opportunities that that has provided for the students very much of so. Barbados. Yeah, very much so. And from, from your recollection, what did this mean to him oh, as a person? Well, that meant a lot. Uh, that meant a lot. I mean... There he is in the 70s. And um, if you had... If you, for example, had seen what he'd written well in advance, I mean, everything was about education, it was about uplifting people. It was, I mean, he had a tremendous view and vision mm -hmm. for this country. Yes. And I must tell you um, that my regard and respect for him and understanding it being a teacher is because I grew up with one. Yes. You yes. know, um, my aunt, uh, my mother's sister, she, when you got it, when you, you know, when you became 14, you had to leave school and you become a pupil teacher and mm -hmm. taught for eight years without a cent. Wow. But she understood people. She understand, she didn't have any children of her own because <clears throat> in those days, you could not have married or have children and stay in the civil service. Mm -hmm. A pretty teacher. All of that changed. Of course. I'm not being partisan, but all of that changed when mm -hmm. a new administration came about. Indeed. And those are those are things that <clears throat> Alison, if I may call you that. Absolutely. That's what I was I know you so long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those are things that really changed the whole outlook in Barbados. And for me personally, as a young man growing up, um, I didn't come out of a rich family, but I used to read a lot mm -hmm. and um, for instance a newspaper the advocate was three cents I was reading the paper for time it was three cents wow no you got a pair nearly three dollars <laughs> you understand <laughs> and of course the, Indeed. the advocate was as broad as your chair mm -hmm. you know because that is how I gained my knowledge and yes. I must say I got caught on on both national and international affairs very very early mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of stuff in my brain, but you know I'm getting older now, so I have to put a lot of things on paper as well too. But but looking at that that period, that period and Mr. Sandyford and what he did, uh, what he said, you know it was tremendous and very clear cut, very very clear cut. Yes. Talking about his persona, people you don't know how people feel inside, huh? But I've never seen the man got angry. I can get very emotional sometimes, I know that, you yes, know, when I'm indeed. breaking my points. But I've never seen a man got angry. Mm -hmm. I've never seen him insulted anybody. As I said, I don't know how somebody feels inside there. But uh, his, his, his road, his path, which I'll speak about next week, his mm -hmm. path has been a fairly rough one. Indeed. There's no question about that. And a lot of what Peter said, a lot of what other people who have been associated with him said, um, his demeanor. You know, his whole attitude, and I believe it comes from teaching. 
because I don't think that there's any people that would ever be critical of Mrs. Sandy Bird. I, I, I mean, they have great memories of him. You know, he, it's true, you know, and, and, and you hear so much, but then you can even hear more and hear more. Um, <clears throat> I certainly imagine that we will, we will look forward to capturing the real pièce de résistance from you uh, next week Wednesday. <laughs> um, when you, you uh, your, your I've official, said a few people too, but you uh, know, official uh, you, you, know uh, you know, uh, a road has a right side and it has a left side. And obviously, I, I, I will try very hard to keep in the center, yes. but I will have to speak of what I know Indeed. and what I experience. Indeed. And I certainly had um, appreciated his, how he embraced me. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what I look at, because obviously, he didn't reach the level, at the academic level of those persons. And therefore, well, they must have saw what they saw in me. And therefore, uh, being a very good, good, you know, my memory is very, very good, very, very, very good. I, I, it hasn't failed me yet, and I'm not a youngster this time. <laughs> but I am thankful. I am very thankful that I was able to come in contact with people like Mr. Sanford. Yes. And if I may invoke here, people like Mr. Barrow. Indeed. I have, um, have gained the trust of those two persons. And we, we thank and you I very much. Greatly appreciate it. Yes, and thank you for sharing your memories with us today. Yes. I notice that we are getting close to Batalis, right. and I believe that your president is online from China. Most likely. So we do want to also give him uh, a moment to, to share his recollections. Thank you so Alison, much. Alison, I appreciate it very much. And uh, of course, your mother was a good friend of mine. <laughs> she was a good friend of my aunt. <laughs> Indeed. So um, I thank you for inviting me. And therefore, I, thank you for I'm very appreciative um, of everything here at CBC. Right. You, you can stay for the moment oh, and they will come and get you. Okay. They but will. I, I am uh, pleased to invite at this time on the line from China, the president of the Democratic Labour Party, Dr. Ronnie Yearwood. Thank you for making the time. We know uh, you are 12 hours ahead of us, I believe, sir. But thank you for yes. being able to join us to share with us your own recollections of, uh, we know that you, you're very saddened that you cannot be here to join in person, but the technology allows you to join virtually. And we'd love to, to get your insights and reflections on Sir Lloyd and his impact on the Democratic Labour Party. Thank, thank you so much for having me, Alison. You're, you're correct, it's almost um, midnight here in um, Beijing at the moment. Um, you know, and I, as I said before, I think it's, it's quite serendipitous and quite fitting that I'm actually here on assignment doing some work in uh, China. And as, as we would have reflected, uh, Sir Lloyd was the first resident ambassador in China. And a lot of the, the, the groundwork and a lot of the benefits that we accrue from China is because of his work. And it was very interesting for a prime minister to go from prime minister to ambassador and it, and it shows the kind of man that he was that it was just about service to country and whenever he was called to serve he did so and he did so honorably and he did so uh in, in a way that always did barbados proud uh you know so i i i find it I um, as i said there's, there's a certain serendipity to be here in in china um, where he would have done such good work and to lay the foundations to allow me to be able to do the work that I am doing at the moment. Uh, Dr. Yearwood, I lost Hello? Yeah. contact. Ah, I, I'm, I'm hearing I you now. Hear you. I lost you for a moment no. there, Dr. Yearwood. Okay, no, I, I was saying that it's quite serendipitous and quite fitting that I'm in China. Uh, and, and Sir Lloyd would have done such excellent work in laying the foundations to build the relationships between Barbados and China. As we approach Batali's to, to begin uh, the procession, what would you say in a, in a kernel would be this most significant recollection for you of Sir Lloyd's contribution to the Democratic Labour Party? I think I think his contribution to the Democratic Labour Party, and we have to remember, he was born in the nineteen thirties. I was born in the late seventies, uh, around. So we are we are generations apart, um, and it, and and but how last then his contribution is to the party would not only be education, but I think his demonstration of service 
to the party and to the country and to always try to do right by the country. Uh, he always put Barbados first and that is important to remember and it is something that I that I take away as an example as a leader. The country must come first. You always have to do well by this country because at the end of the day, we are a small society, we are a small family. You know, we may be different parties, we may be different uh, organizations, but at the end of the day, we are all Barbadians and we have to take care of each other. We have to leverage all of our positions, all of our opportunities to make the best life that we can for our people. And that is something that I think is a lasting legacy for the party. The party is an instrument and an institution to help build the country and to build something for all Barbadians. And I think that's important to take away today. And that, that sense of honor in which he carried out and lived his life. And, 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 and in a way, you know, he didn't have that rancor that we, that we that we get now in politics. And that's something that I also take away, that kind of humility, that kind of dignity, that, that sense of thoughtfulness. Uh, and that is something that I, I really, really take away from him and, and watching him as an example of, of leadership, really, and, and, and moral leadership, a kind of a, a moral authority that I think we, we have lost a lot of that in politics. Ronnie Yearwood, president of the Democratic Labour Party, live from China, joining us with his tribute on behalf of the Democratic Labour Party. Thank you very much, Dr. Yearwood, Thank for you. making yourself available, even though you are 12 hours ahead of us. Our crew is on the road and our crew in studio and our teams are along the route. We now are ready to follow the procession from Batali's and share with you some of the insights. Uh, Major Taylor, uh, we're back with you. You haven't left us. What can we expect from this moment on in the, the procession? Having arrived at Batali's, the casket will be transferred from the hearse to the gun carriage. As you see on your screen, the Guard of Honour, full Guard of Honour, made up of members of the Barbados Regiment and a half guard from the Barbados Police Service, along with the massed bands of the Barbados Police Service and Barbados Defence Force, already formed up, awaiting the transfer and the start of the procession. Two very important um, persons in this procession, I don't know whether by design or happy coincidence, um, are the parade commander, Lieutenant Commander Derek Brathwaite, who is a graduate of Courage Parry School, mm. and the officer in charge of the Bear Party, Lieutenant Coast Guard Sean Hazelwood, Hazelwood, who is a graduate of Harrison College. I just find it interesting that those Both two schools, schools um, have uh, produced members who are holding prominent positions in today's parade. Well, that is a, a, an exquisite design of, of fate and indeed the mighty designer of us all, uh, that, that we should be able to have uh, two prominent professionals in today's parade um, from two schools attended by Sir Lloyd himself. Indeed. And the, 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 the parade area, uh, how, what would we anticipate will follow uh, from this moment? And to date, so far, we are pretty much on schedule. We are very much on schedule, as you will expect from the military. <laughs> Indeed. Um, the parade commander is in charge of the parade. This is Lieutenant Commander Derek Brathwaite. The Guard of Honor consists of two halves of the guard, the right half and left half, on either side of the regimental color. The right half is commanded by Captain Neville Corbin, and the left half, the officer in charge there is Lieutenant Sarah Hippolyte. Now, I mention this because the Barbados Defense Force might appear to, to some as if it has hundreds and hundreds of soldiers. But on occasions like these, the soldiers um, cease their normal labors and don their ceremonial uniforms to perform these duties. Captain Corbin is normally a legal officer during the day, and Lieutenant Hippolyte is a HR manager during the day. 
naturally the guard of honor consists of uh, two halves, 48 one on the right half and 48 in the left half, and they're on either side of the color party. The color is carried by Lieutenant Dexter Hope, and he will have two color sergeants with him, color sergeant Pollard and color sergeant Rock. And the warrant officer of the color party is warrant officer Leroy Chase. At the rear of the parade, you can just make out the conducting warrant officer, Master Chief Petty Officer, uh, Derek Grosvenor. On the left side of the guard, you can just make out the half guard from the Barbies Police Service. And at the closest to us on your screen, the massed band of the Barbados Police Service and Barbados Defense Force. All in immaculate condition and position and dressing and awaiting the start of the procession exactly on cue. And I believe that that is expected to be around 12.25. 12.25. Uh, who inspects the guard before you leave? Well, long before a soldier is permitted even to go on parade, they'll be inspecting themselves, they'll be inspected by their superiors, and certainly when they form up, um, there'll be a, a careful eye cast over them to make sure that everything is in order. Um, dressing and straight lines, very important to the military, and all of that um, has already been done. They're now steady on parade, awaiting the official um, start of the procession. And as we go to the service and indeed for the interment, what are some of the do's and don'ts for you as members of the military on parade? Well, as members of the military, we are always members of the military and a certain level of bearing turnout is expected of us at all times. Um, so the, the soldiers will be minding their, their, the on their best behavior. And um, I'm sure that the conducting warrant officer and indeed the higher command of the force will be uh, taking careful note of anything that does not go exactly according to plan. And there are procedures for dealing with those things after the fact. But I'm very confident that everything here has been so well rehearsed, so well planned, that there is very little chance of anything going wrong even if our friend Murphy tries his best. I understand. What were some of the factors that would come into play in selecting locations? Well, we will need a, a good form-up point, and this location seems um, a very good one here as they make their procession along the road to Spite, through Spitestown to the St. Peter Church. Um, that would have been paced and timed. And so the procession will begin precisely at 1225 because we know